I mean, in the beginning, we developed this like habitual routine. Um, we developed this like community around the thing that we worship. And when that thing goes away, we have no community, we have no routine, we have no identity, and man, we're back in the same trap that we found ourselves in in the first place. Keep in your mind that you chose to do this because you're gonna question that at times. It's no one else's responsibility that you're out there and if you're pushing it too hard, it's no one else's responsibility. If I want my identity to change, but I'm fixed on like, this is what spirituality means, then if I feel some inkling of desire to change that, like, I'm gonna feel like I have no, no hope left. Um, and that's just not gonna cut it for somebody like me. I mean, there's more room height-wise on this side, so if the tattoo is like this, maybe right, then it's there's more room. I could like but. this fits pretty well. Like we could make this a little bit bigger to fill more, uh -huh. and then maybe I can just pull the tiger's arm down a little more. Yeah, to fill it in. Definitely room for two tattoos. Like, yeah, I think I've always been uh, interested in entertaining like impulse with aesthetic. Um, if I want to get it, this is gonna sound like so irresponsible, but if I want to get a tattoo, like I'm just gonna get it. I don't think that um, the tattoo itself is that significant. I think the, like the experience of like committing to something and just saying like, I have this whimsical thought and I'm gonna entertain it and see where it goes um, is really what I enjoy about like getting tattoos or dyeing my hair or, or wearing like weird stuff. Like I really enjoy just entertaining impulse um, in a healthy way. You know, obviously there were impulses in my life previously that I entertained that almost killed me and lots of other people, but I have to be willing to reconcile with that. First beat. Peter was the oldest of the twins by maybe a minute. Hit Pete. A healthy little boy, very active, very smart, um, very, very affectionate, and a wonderful little kid. And this is me. Hello, people. What's happening? I'll take you. <laughs> I don't really remember much from like before I was 18. I don't remember like any birthdays or like family members dying or weddings or anything like that. It's funny, like the memories that I do have of, of being a kid are like the first time doing a particular drug. I remember like the first time I smoked pot, the first time I took painkillers, the first time I injected heroin, and that's pretty much like all I've got from the first 18 years of my life. Ooh, I struggle with the, the early years. I know that he'll say he got going when he was like 12 or 13. I think at the time I didn't think much more about it than everybody smoking a little pot, experimenting, having a beer, seventh grade, eighth grade, very standard stuff. So I didn't really think about addiction as an issue at all for him until probably junior year in high school. I liked to like get away with stuff. I think that was kind of my MO. I really liked getting super fucked up and then going to school and taking a math test and then getting an A on it. Um, I thought that was like the ultimate, like fuck you to everybody. And that act like lasts, you know, a decent amount of time. You know, there's only so many painkillers you can take before you can pass a math test. And it's not actually that many. So I, you know, quickly reached a point where my priorities have shifted like entirely to, uh, I need to find a bunch of cans and recycle them and get some money to buy dope. I'm trying to think if there was like an event 
It's, it's as if the camera hits fast forward when he, when there was, an, there was an event. It was just prior to graduation. Molly came home one night and basically said, go look in the car. There are these pieces of aluminum foil with burned stuff on them. So he must have been burning whatever he was using. So that was the beginning of us taking it very seriously. So when you realize that a kid has the chemistry that is gonna take him to a dangerous place, you think every phone call and every moment that it's too late, Nothing else matters. I think my kid's gonna be dead at any moment. Nothing else matters. The reality of doing intravenous drugs is, and, and buying drugs off the street is that the potency of them will vary a lot. And inevitably, I do too much of a, of a different type of heroin that I hadn't tried before, and the worst thing that you can imagine happens. The first time that I overdosed, a friend had woken me up with Narcan, and the most overwhelming feeling was like, damn, I'm sick again. It's not that I almost died because I really didn't have any attachment to my life at all. I mean, I had broken at that point emotionally, but I just like couldn't let go of the drugs. So I, I spent the better part of seven or eight months kind of going in and out of treatment centers. And to be honest, like at, at every one of those treatment centers, the first thing I did when I got there was find a way to get high. And there, was, there was really no attempt to get sober at all. something you learn the hard way is that it takes as long as it takes. Somebody else can go through 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 40 rehabs, and it just takes as long as it takes. When I was 18, I spent four months in the wilderness in Utah trying to get sober. So these are all letters that I have that uh, my parents and my sister wrote to me over the course of those four months. Um, this is, I'll just read like three paragraphs. Okay, dear Peter, it saddens and worries me to witness the abuse you have continually afflicted on your beautiful young self. I am terrified of losing you to this terrible disease of addiction. I feel powerless. Easy for me to conjure up those long golden eyelashes over your shy brown eyes, much the color of my own, as you'd catch my eye, your expression saying, watch me, mom. When did you start hiding? I miss you. Peter, happy birthday. Happy birthday, honey. When he started to slide, I, for several years, thought, where's that little kid? He's in there somewhere. Right there. His favorite thing, jumping. Jumping, go. I know it feels good, Peter, but we have to go. Your kid's right here in front of you. You know, you could reach out and touch him, and yet he's a million miles away. He's right there, but he's not right there. You're kind of in a boat that's just rudderless, hoping you can find some place to land. Okay, I'm head. I cannot reconcile the developing young man who inhales dangerous chemicals into his lungs, shoots heroin into his veins, and God knows what else in the same home where he was raised. It's so frightening to visualize you the times you could have killed yourself, your girlfriend, your sister, friends, or strangers. But here we are. I can sleep at night for now knowing that you are far away from drugs.
I hadn't listened to something anybody had to say for probably eight years at that point. Um, I met so many therapists over the years that went to a fancy school, but never really experienced anything themselves. And I just didn't believe it when they said, uh, you know, you can help somebody. Um, like easy for you to say with your, you know, fancy psychology degree, like, you know, I've already like totally ruined my life. Um, there's no way that me being a shitty teenager can help anybody. But when I saw people with track marks and tattoos and, you know, shitty hair and like bad eating habits, but like ready to help anybody at any given time, like I believed it, you know? I felt alone at many times in my life and, and feeling like I'm not alone. Um, that's all I need, the acknowledgement, like you're human, so am I. It's been my observation that community is everything because drugs or alcohol, they're running the show. That's your total focus. That's your identity, your job, your life, your love, your recreation, everything. So it needs to be replaced. The easiest identity to get by far is like the badass drug addict. Because all you do is you just do drugs and then you have that identity. And then when drugs went away, I didn't have like this identity that is um, the kid that did drugs, the kid that like messed up people's houses at parties. Um, so I had no identity. I was just nothing. And I think in the beginning of my sobriety, I looked at sport and recreation as this is my avenue to a higher power, to spirituality. I can feel community and serenity and freedom and all these things as soon as I get on my bike. I did that for a handful of years and um, I thought maybe, you know, if I bike more, I'll feel better. I'll be more secure in my identity. And that's when it really escalated from like, this is a hobby that I would like to be highly invested in to like, this is the only thing that matters in my life. So I spent most of the summer this year doing just long, slow rides in preparation for racing the Colorado Trail. I've spent more time preparing for this than I have for any race I have before. Have fun out there. Keep in your mind that you chose to do this because you're going to question that at times. Race day came, the bike felt good, my legs felt good, I, I felt ready to ride. And, you know, the race started uh, really well. I think I, I paced it really well and I, I felt really confident. I rode like 170 miles in the first uh, like 19 hours and topped out on Georgia Pass with a very serious rainstorm. I could hear, you know, thunder hitting like a second and a half after the lightning struck. And I knew it was close, so I was pushing the descent more than I had to. And man, I went over the bars and the bike landed in this, you know, perfect angle to snip the brake cable. And it was over in the blink of an eye, so.
I had locked up like so much of my identity and succeeding in that race. I thought like, okay, if I do well in this race, like my identity as a cyclist will be validated. So it was an identity crisis. Like I, I dropped out of the race and now I'm just like a person who like went on a one day bike ride. It's not, there's no legacy or there's no cool article on bikepacking.com or there's no, um, you know, people in my Instagram DM saying like, great job. And I felt really, really low. I think uh, I laid in bed for like two or three days after that. I did not feel like getting back on my bike at all. It's really good that that happened because um, I realized like I'm not doing it for the right reasons, right? Like the biking is the, this is the reward. I get to feel free on my bike. I get to be on my bike with my friends and have my physical health because of all the other stuff I do to prepare me for that. It's been crucial for me to be like conscious about um, let's not use sport as the vehicle for anything. I want to look at the sport as the reward. Again, like I don't want to be fixated on this particular thing because really like when that thing goes away, there's no more routine, there's no community, you know? Um, so all that for what? So it's important for me to be willing to sort of change what my identity is. The answer that I give right now could be different than the answer that I would give tomorrow or a week from now. Uh, the bike is not gonna ever give me what you know strong discipline in my daily life is going to give me. I can always take 30 seconds to meditate. I can take a couple minutes throughout my day to call people and check in with them. I can take another five minutes maybe to write down sort of like successful things throughout my day. Uh, places that I fell short and, and sort of keep an inventory of like, where am I acting in line with principles that I've identified as important for myself and, and where am I in conflict with those things. Um, regardless of like where I am physically or, or how I'm doing, I have those five minutes a day. I'm so enjoying him as an adult. Because I, when you're a mom, you still, you look at your kid and you see the little three-year-old kid you just do. It doesn't matter how big or hairy they are, tattooed up or anything else, it's just that little kid that you knew. And I'm thrilled to watch his successes. It's great. Yeah, I knew he'd come back. But sometimes I just feel like... Oh, oh.